Controversial to kick us back off to live in person talks because controversial is fun, right? Okay, good. Hopefully, we'll go back. So, so.
so. We're doing a lot. Okay, how many people work at like a 
like a 50 person profit meter here, 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 less, less, less. Okay. Uh, 20 or less. Over 50. Over 50. So over 50 over 100? 100? So we got to be a bigger organization. I'd say 50 is getting like mid size in terms of size. But 100 is getting clarified. Obviously, we've got to be a bigger company. I work about the line here. We're all going to have about 3,000 people. So we've got to focus on the line as well. So, you know, I don't know. That's the perspective. So it's interesting. So the way you're in the company is that probably like 20 or less. So I'm going to go to a quick history lesson though because uh, it's fun to talk about the history of all these software and repairing practices a little bit and try to get an understanding of where these things came from. Because why why do we practice now? Why is it taught as taught with ads? How long has it been in the industry? Why do you start to start to talk about it? So let's talk about that a little bit. So one of the big things that usually comes up when we debate about this is that you hear about by generation anyway was the shift from water bottle to ads. So you can see here that in the last few years, there's been a shift from water bottle to ads. So, so the big knock was water, water funnel takes forever to ship to stop that. And what happens is you do the requirements and design all the stuff up front, and then you don't go away and build it, and for a long time, and then you test it, and then you deliver it, and the customer says, that's not what I want. And it will be a year, or two, or two, or three, three, after you start started. And so it's a big disconnect with feedback and these kinds of things. So we wanted to move to the more important thing to stop. And this is the style of what they want to come in and And there's a whole different kind of approach to that. So, you know, I just mentioned, I spent some of the things at Rational Software earlier in my career. So, this came about in about, from what I can tell, from poking around on the media and different places, about 1997, this Rational Unified Files was this thing about that. Where they wanted, they wanted to, to start, start changing, changing the way we build software from the traditional very regular approach. Magnetic approach, 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 appro
Okay. Yeah, we'll based on this. This is 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 See the names down bottom too. There's a bunch of people that are part of contributing to this. I don't know if you're familiar with some of these names. They're older, so they're from my generation, not thrilled when I went through computer science. But you see people here like Dave Thomas, Kent Beck, Ward Cunningham, Mark Fowler. Mark Fowler is still very prevalent in the industry. If you know Potworks, if you know what the technology radar, any of those things, that's from Potworks organization, which is still spearheaded by Mark Fowler. And a lot of the patterns that you know today, like microservices, originated from Mark Fowler's organizations. So they're still very, very influential within our organization, within our profession, right? So I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to exit here now because I found some good videos too, so that you don't have to keep listening to me talk the whole time. And so there's a one here I want to introduce. Um, uh, this guy's name is Alan uh, Pullum. I don't know if you know or heard or seen any of his talks. I recently discovered him and he's brilliant. He's very he works at uh, Berkeley, he's a professor there, he's an independent consultant, he's an author, well, tons of books. Uh, but he, he is very, um, let's say, he doesn't mind sharing his direct opinions about what he thinks of uh, how Agile is practiced a lot today. So I'm just going to play a little clip here. I'm hoping you're going to hear it. I'm, uh, if not, then I won't play any more videos. I've got my volume cranked up and see how that works. Does everybody just hold your breath? <laughs> not going to hear it. The CC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
audio to the to the speaker. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now where do I do that from? It's in your system settings. Yeah, system settings. Here we go. Share. Yeah. Do you control center up in the top of the menu bar by your date? Can you option click on the sound tab there? No. Yeah, it's not showing up in that. Okay, we'll try it with that. Um, it's too bad. I didn't think of having an extra speaker. All right, let's see what we get. This is Jared as the devil, as far as he concerns what he says here. <laughs> Did we get a link to this in the data factory? Yeah. So I'll stop it there just because uh, it's probably probably good enough to get the point. But so uh, cat cat back and Quebec <laughs> <laughs> according to the closed caption says that. Uh, according to them, like, you know, from their original intention, it's gone off a lot, gone straight a lot, right? So again, like I'm I'm pushing stuff to more of the extreme side views here to provoke thinking and, and challenge. But um, it's interesting to see that from people who started and started with the Agile Manifesto when they look at where industry practices are largely today. They're kind of like, uh, what's going on here? Like, this seems like it's got very religious, dogmatic. People are pushing things. And I'll be one of the people, like I said earlier, too, right? Like, I've worked really hard at trying to make Scrum work in companies and organizations and trying to get it effective and following through on the practices and coaching people on what to do. Um, and uh, I guess a few years ago, I kind of, I don't know how many years ago, it was, uh, three or four, I started thinking, like, I don't know if I can attend another sprint planning meeting without slamming my head in the door before I go in there anymore because I'm just getting to the point where this is getting nauseating. So I'm uh, just getting bored of it myself. But also, I didn't know it was effective to do this constantly every two weeks over and over and over again. Like, what was the effectiveness? Can't, like, estimating and all those kinds of things, right? So why pick on Scrum? So I guess the reason why, uh, of course, that's going to end up, okay, we'll start with one minute. Because Sam joined. Uh, Sam. <laughs> um, I pick on Scrum because first thing is first is that a lot there's a lot of statements where you can search this. Scrum kind of claims it is agile. If you're not you're not if you're not doing Scrum, you're not really following agile practices, and that's not true. Well, that that's sort of really is not true based on a lot of learnings and experience I've had in a lot of different organizations lately. Um, that's really not true. It's actually probably. It's uh, closer to waterfall and scrum uh, than agile in some cases because of the amount of process of work that's put in place. So the amount of ceremonies you need to produce over short periods of time that create waste, create extra meetings for people, distract focus, all these things you add on and layer on, not to mention estimating. But one, the other thing too I want to mention too, there's another good talk I'll link uh, from Alan as well, and it focuses on no estimates. And there's math done to show that estimates, how bad they are, uh, like overall, right, in general, how bad we are making them. And one of the things that I used to do, so I got a little story here, uh, I used to do this with Trump teams, is we would, 
um, we would work on several sprints. So we'd do like, I don't know, four, six, or eight sprints, and then we'd we execute it for a while, right? So we had all kinds of point estimating done. But we still had a massive backlog of, I don't know, 600 tickets or something stupid like that. So if people want to know how long is it going to take you to get through the next 100 tickets in order to ship the software we want to ship, right? So the trick was, oh, well, let's take our average estimate point value, put it on the whole backlog, and that's going to roughly give us our date with a little bit of factor. And it actually worked, which is crazy, which probably means to tell you that when you think about it. Estimating probably wasn't that great. <laughs> if we could do that, and it would actually turn out to be fairly close. So they did some math in one of the videos he did, and it shows that there's a whole couple different ways of going that even with, with estimating, without, without estimating, and with counting just stories, you could end up in roughly the same place of the revenue within a matter of weeks. It's crazy. So a really good talk. It's called uh, by Alan, and it's called No Estimates. It's an older talk. It was in 2015. But it's cool. Yeah. Question on that. How do you end up with a backlog with 600 items in it? You can end up with that when you have a product 20 years old. Or you have a department one person. Or you have a department one person, yeah. I, I'm, honestly, I don't know if I had 600, but the whole product that what the company I worked for, we, are, we were about, the companies were 275, the product was nearly 20 years old. Yeah. I'd say if you took across all the teams, it was thousands and thousands of tickets. Box. I'm pretty sure uh, if you start a Jira project, it just comes with a thousand tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first ticket is how to set up Jira. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, I think there might actually be a milestone for yeah. the very first yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, I might have been exaggerating with the 600, but hundreds for sure. That's not, not even an understatement, like hundreds. hundreds. Um, so again, what do the claims imply, right? When we say Scrum is agile, what's it implying? It's what they're saying is if you don't do these ceremonies and practices, then you're not really being agile. It's kind of what it sounds like they're saying. But it's become an industry. I think this is a sign in and of itself, but if you look at it in terms of like the certifications and stuff you can get now. So I'll kind of dig into that uh, another way. Another reason to pick on Scrum is scaled out scaled agile framework. Have you ever looked at that safe thing and looked at scaled agile framework? It's crazy. It's like there's so much process engineering put into place, I don't know how people ever deliver any software because of the amount of stuff. But what it is is taking Scrum and trying to scale it across organizations like crazy. So there's all kinds of roles, interactions, requirements to, for Scrum teams to develop, collaboration, and whatnot. So it gets kind of nuts in that hand. So all these things are actually agile. So that's why I'm taking on Scrum today. So here's my thing, another reason to pick on Scrum. So we have organizations like Scrum.org, Scrum Alliance, and you can get all kinds of fancy certifications in Scrum, and Scrum Master certifications, and product owner certifications. You don't have to work in a dev team, though. You can go get them. And uh, you're certified to now teach people how to do Scrum. So a little bit of a jab here, but... Um, I don't know. It doesn't seem to make sense to me if you haven't done it, worked in a team, you haven't delivered software. It's really hard to actually practice these things and coach people how to do it. So uh, that's one thing. That's reason why I'm not I say, I don't know, this thing needs, this needs to go away. So some comics for entertainment value. There's a lot of these cool ones out there. So everything you see here, I've stole off the internet. Um, so congrats on your new Scrum Master certification. How's it going with your team? Pretty good, actually. Even though we usually change the sprint backlog, make the sprints, don't have a sprint goal, the PO doesn't want reviews, and the developers hate doing retrospectives. I feel like we're getting into the Agile spirit. Uh, so what are you doing? We agreed to call it Kanban. Mm -hmm. I love Scrum sure. It's really good, right? So uh, and that's like rings through. Like I don't know like how many times are any of you in here, but if you tried to do retrospectives every two weeks, how many dev teams like doing that and felt good they got good value out of it? actually meeting and trying to come up with something like, I know sometimes what I tried to do it was like pulling teeth to try to get somebody to say something like, what can we improve? Like, well, I don't know, we just did this for two weeks, we did it two weeks ago, like, can we just work longer and see what happens? Like, you know, every so many you get a good one, right? But you kind of have to start skipping them to get value out of the meetings. Like, if you did one every two weeks, you know, people start looking like, this is, get, feels like it's a waste of time, right? Because we didn't even have a chance to implement the last idea because we're too busy because we had to plan our sprint, or we had to plan our sprint. 
then we had to figure out how many points we could get. Then we couldn't get enough, we couldn't get all those points done because our velocity wasn't that high and we had to change stuff around and jam it all in and then we had carryover from our last sprint. So we had to deal with all those problems. Um, so the retrospective felt like it was wasteful almost, right? Because there's just almost too many things going on to apply or actions that never ever got done because of the iterations were so short. Shouldn't that be part of the retrospective? <laughs> It, yeah, it does, usually does, but a lot, a lot of times I'm fine, it comes up, right, so it comes up in the retro, but then you can't act and implement the change quick enough to actually make it fit into the next one, right, in two weeks, and it's tough to make it fit in. Right? So. Yeah. Now this is just a picture of the whole Scrum plan, the whole phase that uh, if you work in Scrum or are familiar with it, for those of you who haven't, this is sort of what it all does, right, so this is everything that happens, but this happens every two weeks. So you're doing, you're reviewing your product backlog, you're prioritizing it, you're grooming it, there's a role someone has to be doing that. You need to estimate the work in order to get to your sprint planning meeting, then have everybody at the planning meeting for an hour or two, or half a morning, or a day, whatever it takes, to plan that next sprint. And then you get into your old cycle, daily stand-ups. No, no, not all of this is terrible and bad, right? Some things I think are, are still good and have value. Um, the things that kind of get back on the original stuff in the manifesto, I think, are they like interactions, right? Getting people to collaborate. Those are good things, right? Uh, then you go to your sprint review, and then you have your retrospective. So this kind of always cycles every two weeks, right? So it's consistently going, consistently going. The idea was, is that uh, if we practice like this, we can create a sustainable pace. Anybody think that's sustainable over a long term? Yes. Slow yeah. is still pace. Is that? Slow is still pace. Slow is still pace. But the thing is, companies don't want you to go slow. They want you to get faster every sprint. They want your velocity to go up. Because they look at your metrics and say, well, I've we've More estimated points so many story points. Was that? Put more points on the tickets. Put more points on the tickets, <laughs> right? Game the system. Um, what happens if you can't get something done? I know one of the things I used to do, I'll pull my hair because I don't have any left, so it's gone, so it's not going to But uh, if you don't get a ticket done and it's an eight pointer, so again, it resonates with people who have done story point estimating and, and strong. So uh, if you haven't done it, we can talk more after too. But basically, like the whole idea is you got a ticket in there, once it goes into your two weeks, it's worth eight points of work. You got to get it done in the two weeks, right? That's the idea. You get it complete. Oftentimes, though, something that's estimated higher or unknown because you haven't figured it out yet doesn't get done. So if the whole ticket doesn't get done, it carries over to the next sprint, and you don't get credit for the points. So your velocity goes lower, but the company wants you to go faster, wants your velocity higher, and they're probably comparing teams even though they say they don't. Because management, I'll blame myself, I was in management, but I didn't do this. But management likes to compare teams. And say, well, this team is producing 60 points, and this team's only doing 30. They're half as productive, they're not as good. Why? Why is this team over here not doing as well? They're failing. They need to go faster. So, engineering manager go over and get them to work faster because they're not producing enough points. Right? That happens. It happens naturally because they're numbers that are comparable. The other thing that happens too points are meant to take out days and time, they end up getting equated to time all the time. Because what happens is, you look at it, well, it take, took, takes two weeks, um, and I'll have to start off another meeting in a second, I guess. I'll take a break in a minute and stop talking before I transition into the next meeting. Uh, so, um, where was it going? So basically, uh, the, the comparing was what I was talking about, so I almost said, I think it was. Points are meant to take out time. Points are meant to take out time, yes. So what happens is, you do X number of points over a certain period of time. So every two weeks you do 60 points, the math adds up. You every So that means you should be doing that. So that's what the team can do over two weeks. So if you estimate a backlog to be 120 points, that's gonna take you four weeks to do it. And you'll be held to that, well it's gonna be four weeks. If you don't do that four weeks, even though you're estimating points, which don't actually reflect time, you will generally be asked why you're late even though we didn't estimate a time because we used points. But that happens a lot, that gets turned around a lot with Scrum, right? So that's another reason why I pick on Scrum because I think those things get construed. But we're talking, I think that's what Alan's talking about, that's what Ken Beck is talking about, that's what we're talking about when we kind of transition across these 
methodology is particularly strong is that it gets twisted around a lot, a lot more easily than what the whole true intention of doing natural practices is. Like. So I'll um, I'll kick off a new Zoom again. Sure. the best thing to do. I'm capturing everything here with the, the camera. I think it's okay. streaming okay. So how about that? Do you know that India is recursive? India is recursive? Yeah. It stands for I'll never drink India again. <laughs> <laughs> Is going to be more than 40 minutes? I can set up a meeting or my. I should be able to finish it for you. Yes? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll I have pro if, if you need to be. Yeah. Well, I have some pro. I'll, I'll pay, pay okay. for it. So. No, I'll call off. Okay. I was told that it's roughly equivalent to one day. Yeah. <laughs> And if you're and if during the scrum over, you can scrum over. Um, you had to estimate. Um, you know, generally, it would just take a week or two weeks or seven. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's, that's, that happens a lot. So <laughs> That was a milk. That was a milk job. And, yeah. and the guy who was doing that was probably doing so. Oh, okay. He was coming. He wasn't coming. Oh, too late to so now I'm going to just like, one thing I missed from the early days of Agile is the attitude that if you don't finish your points count, you're obviously Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Smart man, smart man. It's gone good at 39 people, including the Gus Orbis and one person on my probably dropped out already, but 40 people. No. <laughs> Oh, really? I posted the new link in the channel. I think we're going to get going again. Yeah. Heads up. Okay, everybody. We're going to get started up again now. If you want to come have a seat, Jamie will take us to the ice from his dad. There'll be time to network after. I hate cutting people off, but I'm being the center of attention. So, please come have a seat. All right, we'll kick it off again. So, uh, it's awesome to get back live because we can actually socialize with people, which is really good. So, I'll uh, do a bit more and uh, talk about, too, not just pick on strong, although it's fun, right? It's really fun to, to pick on something, but I won't keep doing that the whole time. I will pick on Kanban a little bit uh, because it's not fair to strong not to have a partner. And then uh, we'll talk about some different ideas and some different approaches, okay? But again, this is meant to open up uh, thinking and also think about how, you know, where you are in your organization now and, and how you're practicing. And if you struggle trying to adopt something like Scrum or Kanban or uh, you're working in a process but you feel like maybe it's, it's not quite driving or you're not following it as it should be, uh, then what can you do? Like, do you have to like go double down and try to like make sure you're following all the processes perfectly, or do you have some other options? That's the idea, here, right? Get everybody thinking. So, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this. I worked for a startup based out of the U.S., and um, we didn't practice Scrum. Shocker. Uh, and uh, they used to call Scrum was like ticket taking. So eventually, you become like a ticket taker. And you got to roll the tickets that keep coming at you, and you keep taking them every two weeks, tearing them off, and getting them done, and throwing them up, come back again, and taking their set of tickets. Kind of go through like that, right? Mm -hmm. And lose sight of the big picture a lot, because especially new new developers, junior developers, if you weren't being engaged with other parts of the company a lot, you could easily get lost in the mess of the tickets and the pumping them through. So ticket taking was one of the things that used to used to kind of knock on Scrum. Um, I had to get rid of this. So no little comic here, but basically this is just the whole thing about, I'll paraphrase this one because I thought this was hilarious when I saw it, because I've done it. Uh, it's like, um, so you know where our stories seem to get keep getting stuck, and they get blocked. So like, yes, we should do something about that. Let's start unlocking our stories better and actually like, do something about it and unblock them. And the, then the Scrum Master's like, yes. So I've added a co column to our board called Blocked. So if your story's blocked, you can move it there. So uh, it's so, uh, funny, but again, one of those things in the, where I talked about sort of that carryover process and the whole pointing system and how it can play games against you. But that's another thing that happens too, right? Something goes in there, it was 8 or 13 points. There was a whole pile of discovered work or all know what you had to investigate, dig into, had to go back talk to the business. It got stuck in there for two weeks and all of a sudden your velocity is out of whack and you're trying to figure out why and explain it to upper management. You, know, you can see where this all goes. I've never had to do that before. Um, so can that must be the answer, right? Um, what I would say about it is it, it's got some pros for sure. Also think about where it came from. So this was originated from Toyota. They make cars on an assembly line. It's really easy to flow through an assembly line, 
limit your work in progress, stop the line when there's a problem, fix it, and then keep the line going again. So flow, continuous flow, which is what Kanban really represents, because there's no time box iteration for delivery. A continuous flow to manufacture a car that's going to be the same thing every time once it's designed and built works fantastic. Right? Software, imagine if software worked like that. Um, if, if you were trying to build a car like you built software, you'd start off, and I don't know how many wheels we'd start with, but we'd probably end up having 10 and we'd have three engines and we'd have a whole pile of different stuff, but it would iterate like crazy, right? On the car. I'm joking around with the engine. So, but we we do a lot of iterating on the car. So what the initial design intent would be, and what we ended up with would be completely different. And then the next time we built another car, it would never look like the first car. It would be completely different again because we'd be building a different piece of software. So that's the thing, right, where it kind of, I think, where it differentiates, and that's why I think Kanban, while it's got a lot of uh, pluses about it, and it's got a lot of traction, I think it's got some knocks because its origination is the continuous flow from a manufacturing line. So think about that, right? And sometimes what a lot of people struggle with Kanban is when do we deliver software? What's our end date? What's our time box? How do we figure that out? And there's a lot of prioritization that needs to happen. But they did get rid of estimates. Um, so this here shows a little joke about a continuous flow diagram, right? So basically, like, you know, they're talking about all the great um, processes and how we can identify problems in delivery flow. So for example, there's a continuous flow, a continuous flow diagram. And it shows work in progress across all stages and how they converge and get delivered. And the whole point of this is, the whole point of a cumulative flow diagram is when you converge to the point of completion and you're, they meet, that's when you're going to deliver. And it's just the, the whole joke here is like, so how are we doing? And the guy's like, I don't know, but the colors are cool because there's so much going on. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at a continuous flow diagram in Jira, but I've never figured them out. They were always tough to figure out. It's always like, it keeps growing, and the lines never meet. I don't know why. Like the backlog keeps growing. So it's crazy, right? What do we do? Like, I don't know. There's all kinds of buzzwords going on. The industry is kind of all over the place. Two big ones are Kanban, Scrum, Spritz, and Sprints. How do we get disruptive? There's a lot out there to think about. But like this, just eating up the words here. Ah, there's got to be another answer, though. We can combine the two and do scrum band. That would be good, right? This is the thing, real thing. There's a guide on how to go from scrum to scrum band too. If you want to check it out. I think a lot of people inadvertently end up doing this, and they don't even know they're doing it, though naturally because they struggle with some aspects of Scrum. They're struggling how to implement it and they're looking at all the practices of it and they don't want to have the overhead. They're frustrated by it. They like Kanban, but there's parts of that they don't love too. And they end up getting somewhere in the middle here where they've got both things going on. I mean, I don't know. It's a thing, but it could be pretty good. Like, I mean, it's, there's, some, there's some pluses for thinking about, hey, maybe this could have some viability. Um, I still think you got overhead. But what they do here is they the, the goal here is to start eliminating some of that overhead, right? So you don't see any estimating. But there is a sense of a bit of time boxing so you can kind of predictably deliver. And that's at the end there where it says trigger your planning. So basically it's like, okay, we have 10 features we want to deliver in a bucket that's a releasable and valuable piece of software somebody's going to get value out of. So we're going to release that. And so when we get that done, it's going to trigger our next planning increment. And we're going to do another planning meeting, and we'll go through and figure out what we're going to put in and prioritize, and that'll win to that chunk. So that's kind of the way they, they flow through it, right? So there's a sense of putting in those kind of iteration time boxes, but they're not fixed necessarily, right? And they do put in work in progress limits. They talk about visualizing the work, but most people have scrum boards, so most people already visualize the work anyway, right? That's already being done. And adding more columns just means with, with Kanban teams, you probably notice with if you've worked in them or you do it, like you see the number of columns on the board grow significantly because what happens is where there's no fixed iteration to deliver, you need to put you need to represent all the various states in which your item can land in before it gets done. And the definition of done will vary, right? My definition of done has been shipped and it's in production and it works and somebody can use it. But most some people's definition of done is I committed to code and I just pushed it to give up. Done. But, right? So what does it mean? What's done? And so that's why you see a lot of representation of states in your Kanban boards. And see more and more grow in there. It's because they want to get more granular because it flows through. That's interesting. Anybody thought for that looked it up before? Is it there? 
Do we have any other options though? Got to be more options. Right? So I'm going to propose this one here too as well. And it's it kind of goes back to some of the original Agile manifestos and manifesto ideas. But it's got some things too that you know we need as a business to kind of function well. And it's got some really good stuff in it. So this is from a company called Basecamp. Anybody know Basecamp? Anybody ever hear Shape Up before? Okay, cool, nice. So Shape Up is is uh, something they came up with when they were building their product, Basecamp. And they tried a bunch of different things, right? And they realized that there was a, a lot better way they could be working to deliver things uh, and to free up people uh, to give the engineering staff and the design staff and everybody who's part of putting together a software product to give them more freedom to do their work, right? So this is what they came up with called Shape Up. So they call it Stop Running in Circles. You can look up the book online, so just Google Basecamp Shape Up. The book is free online to read. Um, and a lot of, uh, this is from their book and all the stuff I got in here now it goes through is all from their book online. Uh, I was lucky enough to practice this twice already. I did it with the, the US startup I worked with. Uh, we heavily used it there and then also did it with, a, with one of the startups I, uh, I helped lead the team here with as well. So when we introduced it there, we were doing Scrum and it, it got frustrating and we switched basically in, in a week to go into shape up. So what is shape up? So here they work in six week cycles. So there's a six week time box of delivering where you, you tend to deliver work. But that doesn't mean you can't iteratively ship work. Like if you're like a continuous uh, delivery shop, you can still ship inside of that. But oftentimes you probably don't even need to ship that frequently. Like, you know, unless you've got patches to happen, like if you want to do a meaningful piece of work that's actually got meat on the bone to deliver something of value, like most people have a hard time getting that two weeks, let alone a couple day turnaround, right? So the, the, what they found at Basecamp was that six weeks was a really good time frame to deliver something big enough that you could actually build it, think about it, think through it a bit, but small enough that if it failed miserably, you could throw it away and it was only six weeks of work. It wasn't three months or six months or a year, right? It was more palatable as a business to spend time on that bit, they call it, right? The other thing here, and which this is where I kind of get to the sustainability thing, is with Scrum, if you've ever worked in Scrum in two week increment sprints, it feels like you're constantly in a hamster wheel where you're going two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, and you never get time to look up and breathe. What happens in those systems? Anything like tech debt never gets done. Anything like a DevOps operational problem that's not bleeding, like burning you right now, will never get done. It won't get prioritized. You've got to go beg the product owner to prioritize something. And then you've got to justify how to break it up in a two-week sprint. And if you've got to rewrite your continuous delivery system because it's totally boshed, then good luck doing that in two weeks or breaking it up, splitting it up, right? This just can't happen. Like, we're going, oh, we're going to switch from, you know, ECS to a Kubernetes managed system. You're not doing that in two weeks. Good luck. Right? Not going to happen. So, you know, you don't get a chance to do any of that kind of work, um, side of the desk or not. And then, so what happens too, a lot of projects are like, well, you know what? We'd really like you to do this thing, uh, but we don't have the ability to prioritize this group, but maybe you could kind of do it on the side of your desk, you know, like you know, the nights we can, you know, they get it done because it's important, but the business doesn't prioritize that. So you tend to get that kind of stuff bleed into uh, Scrum sprints a lot. And so what they've done here is they've introduced two week cooldown periods. Now I've worked in organizations where we've done them for one week. Uh, again, this is a transitioning thing, right? Where businesses kind of need to own up and realize what value you get from doing two weeks. But the idea of the cool two-week cooldown is, as a development team or anybody who's part of the role, you get to work on whatever you want. It's your choice to work on what you want. So during the six weeks, you get prioritized, and the, you got to work on what the business needs you to work on, right? we got to work on the next features. We need this to deliver to users. But the two weeks is a, is a time frame for you to pick what you want to work on. As long as it brings value, work on it. If you want to learn a new framework, you want to, uh, uh, you know, um, brush up on certain skills or new languages? Do you want to fix a DevOps problem? Is there a bunch of refactoring that you really wanted to do that you couldn't get to? You want to get started on it? You want to experiment with something new? You had a great idea for the product, but it never gets prioritized? Hey, why don't you go prototype it? Those kinds of things, right? And that slack is not built into any other system because it's always about producing, producing, producing. So they put that in place here, and that's brilliant. Um, when we, where I worked in the US, we 
we protected this like crazy. The only thing that would happen sometimes is we would ship, and we would ship at the end of the cycle, and then we'd get a we got a regression bug, and we had to patch it. That would eat into cycle like the, the cool down periods, right? So that would suck. And so what we would do with that is we'd say, you know, we really want people to get the cool down. So let's work with you to, to figure out, okay, what can we do to plan our six-week cycle better so that we don't bleed into the one week or the two-week cool down, right? So it was one of these things that everybody really valued it. You know, no stand-ups. They're basically, all the, all the reins are completely off. No planning. You got a two weeks to do one day. And the, and the development teams, uh, funny enough, I don't know what you think, but they loved it. Everybody loved it. They felt freer and happier, for sure. Um, and one other thing there, too, though, is important, is, like, is the shipping aspect, right? That you're meant to you meant to ship software, so the goal is to ship something to production, right? And there's some other cool things in here we can get into as we go through. Now I know um, Mark is here. Mark and I practiced this at briefly, so I don't know. If I can uh, Mark can give me a break in a minute too. Maybe he can talk a little bit about his experience there too. But, um, so if you want to chime in at any point, Tom, you can holler at me. Um, if we look at sort of just this whole task list here, right? This is kind of what I'm talking about. One of the things that happens a lot in, and this can, this really takes over in, in Kanban, where as you discover work, because you didn't know about it, it bleeds into the scope of it and then it keeps going on, right? Like you never deliver. With Scrum, you discover it, you throw it on the backlog, or you keep trying to do it and you end up being late and you don't get your, all your plan worked on. So it kind of goes either way or another. So the idea with with uh, Shapeo is that you know this is going to happen, and uh, I'll just talk about a little bit what the velocity equals here, and then I'm going to come back to that. But that's just one of the things I wanted to pre see is like you know that ever growing list of discovered tasks that comes up. I'm sure, you've all experienced it, right? You can estimate the work really well, but then you can start working on it, and all of a sudden you discover, ah, that system I need to integrate with did not work like that at all. It works totally different. And it might only add three, four, three or four days, but you don't know that because you've got to dig in for two to figure out what your alternatives are. And that really impacts you know, two weeks of work, right? Whereas in a six-week chunk where you've got some negotiation on scope and flexibility and you've got an empowered autonomous team, it makes a big difference and you're able to work, work with it better. But one of the things here, velocity. So velocity, that we know about in Scrum, is how many story points can you do? But what is velocity really? It's like it's focused and undistracted time and working on the things that matter the most. That's how you actually get real velocity. It's not by adding extra overhead. So extra meetings, Slack conversations, tickets, reporting, time sheeting, overcomplicating features, over engineering, and working on nice to haves, they all take away from velocity. And one of the things Shape Up tends to promote is a lot more yes ands than no buts. So when you're working in smaller increments, someone asks you for an idea, you say, no, but we don't have capacity, no, but we don't have space, no, but we haven't done this yet, no, but you tend to work in constraints a lot more than you do in, in a system where you're encouraged to talk about what scope means and negotiate it. And that's what they encourage shape of. It's, it's to negotiate your scope, and once you've got a business goal, you're not told how to do it. And you don't even necessarily, you shouldn't even be given a wireframe what a UI could look like. It's like, we need someone to be able to do this type of activity. They need this type of capability. The result of a user using our system is to get this result. Then it gives the team working on it the, the power to decide the simplest way to build that and the best way they can hope to build that, right? And the, the how is really separated from the why. And that bleeds in a lot when you've got really tight couple product owners in, in Scrum practice. This is an example, it's hard to see here, but this is an example from their book, that's on the site, go look it up, of a shaped up story. So the way that it works there is where it works in six week cycles, you have, they have stories and cycles. The stories are just their feature specs essentially, and they talk about what, uh, you know, what capabilities you want to put in there. But you'll notice like they got screenshots of like existing things, and see these here? They do things called like, you know, breadboarding like you do on hardware engineering and fat macro schedules is called. So you're not gonna see like hard code like UI design. The UI design will happen in the six weeks in collaboration with the team, right? 
but this is an idea of how it could be done, but it doesn't fix it on like, it must work like this. It gives you the freedom to negotiate how it could work. And I think Mike, you mentioned before one of the things you said about Scrum, or about the old days of Agile, what we used to do a, bit, a lot more, is that when things couldn't get done, you'd, you'd negotiate more about, well, we can't do all of it, what do we want to do? We have a talk about scope, right? And we deliver based on that. And that's one of the things you really want to shape up strongly encourages, especially early on in cycles. Talk a lot about and really collaborate with your business teams and across everybody in the organization that needs to be involved in this story, right? In each different story you have, you have a team that's going to work on that story, and that's from all different parts of the company. Collaborate with them to figure out what that scope needs to look like. And then show progress as you go, but you've got enough time to adjust. So instead of oh no, we're two weeks in, we're going to demo it, and it's not going to work. You've got those four weeks to, to make corrections, right? So but the important thing is the size of the shape of story needs to fit in a six-week, you know, application model. Which is, takes work getting to do that point, though. That takes work, and it takes more upfront work than we'd often see, too, right? There's a lot more thought needs to go into something. And the shaping process, which has got to happen in parallel to the dev team, so a lot more work has to happen there to really define what something's look like and think about it. And understand your users better. So just you know, another point there was this get to the scope thing. So it's all great. You shape up the story, and you look at it as a dev team. You're like, wow, this is crazy. How are we ever going to get it all done? But you know, it's going to take longer six weeks to do that whole board, right? But no, not if we focus on this one use case. A good example they got in the book is the way they built their calendaring system in Basecamp. And they were going to do a complex thing about indicating what days are busy and whatnot. And they realized that all they needed to do was do like this little red dot annotation on a simple calendar graphic, and it delivered the feature. And so they built that first. And then they kind of iterated on that over the six weeks. But they were able to do that in a six-week time frame, right? And kind of build it on. So if you read the book, you'll see more about it. I don't know off by heart the whole story. And this is another thing that strongly encouraged, and uh, we used to do this a long time ago too, I think, I seem to remember it, but, um, you know, scaffold something up. Uh, there's terminology we kind of use for it a couple of ways when we're trying to describe it, is encouraging teams to either scaffold up your system, but it doesn't work very well, it's very poorly implemented, but it's all connected, or build a walking skeleton. Look up walking skeleton, right? The idea is, you know, it's not going to have all the bits and pieces. It's not going to all connect. It's not going to all have all the bells and whistles. But I'm going to have a system that I go to. I'm going to go to a URL. Let's say it's a basic product or a mobile app. So I'm going to go to a URL. It's going to give me a blank, a page with no styling, with a poor link that's going to pull in a hard-coded database table that actually called the REST API that was running in AWS that connected to the real database, and it, we deployed it. That's a walking skeleton of a very simplistic view of something. You're not going to ship it. But now what happens is you can start, see all those pieces of the pie that are off in the separate check marks? If you do them all independently, you end up with a fragmented system that never integrates until the end. If you do the slices like this, you've got an integrated system. Now you can start building the check marks. Guess what? You've already got your pipeline for an integrated system, so you can start actually working in parallel. And this works. It really works if you think about walking skeletons. It also helps you do another thing, which we encourage is to work backwards from your date. If you know you've got six weeks to do it, look at your date and work backwards to think, well, what are all the things we need to do in this time box to make sure this is going to get done? And that helps you encourage that scope negotiation up front. Because if you realize, wow, these things are going to be blocking, we don't understand this problem, we don't understand this technology, we don't know how to implement something, it really encourages that. So. How do you track progress, though, right? So there must be some ways in this track progress. Basecamp came up with some ways in their software to do it. Um, I've done it where we use different uh, teams, use different approaches. Like one of my teams at one place, they tracked in a Google Doc, and they marked off a base of the story. They'd go in and indicate what they did. It wasn't great, uh, but we could indicate progress. And then I would, as the, I was an engineering manager in that case, I would go in and check my team's progress and be in check with the team, and then I updated in the visual for my DP, right? Um, one team we use, like GitHub, uh, GitHub uh, issue tracking, which we use like Zendesk, and that's Zendesk, Zendhub. And like kind of like Jira, but not quite. And we had a board, we track stuff in there just so we know what got done, what didn't get done, and then put that up through the system. So that's 
So there's different ways you can track. Uh, they encourage something called, um, what's, this, what's this called? Mark, do you remember what this is called? Oh, got it lost now. Yeah. No, it's, not, it's not a flow chart. Is it a flow chart? Hill, hill, hill diagram. Yeah. yeah, hill chart. Hill chart. Hill chart. Hill chart. Yeah. So, and this is the idea of like, you know, we've got to start, we start and we've got a series of unknowns. And as we work through, we all keep the status as to, are we over the hill of known? And then as we get over to the hill of known, we're getting into getting done, and we can kind of indicate how far along the path we're gone. The Basecamp built tooling in their software Basecamp did two of these hill charts, and we can actually create them for you. Um, I haven't worked with them, but that's what they do do. I don't know if you guys start working with Mark after. Yeah. You know, there's different ways, right, to, you can come up with ways of, it's not prescribed, per se, base camps are, the base camp authors are pretty good about not creating it as, like, a, as a free, so I guess, as dogmatic, they've left it open to say, like, you know what, this is how we do it, um, but this is kind of a really good suggestion for ways that we found really effective, one trust them. And just just take away the key concepts here, I won't read them all out loud, you can have a look at them quickly, but... You know, some of the key concepts that this is in the end of the summary of the section of the book. Um, about, you know, the key things you're getting at uh, that you can, you can kind of get out of it as you, if you want to adopt an approach like this. They always say one of the big things they start here, I guess, is in order to, like, um, there's a lot of good in, in shape up, but you may not, like, trying to change your organization to switch to shape up overnight is, is you may not get by in very easily, right? But there's a lot of good things here you start teasing up, taking up, and maybe do experiments with, or try things, or try to tease things into your current Scrum practice, current Kanban practice, and say, you know what, I really like what they did there. How can we apply that to what we're doing today? And they say they try things at a time. One of the things they highly encourage to do, though, and I totally recommend it, and I've had to do it with teams, too, is you fix shipping first. So if you can't ship software well, you can't get things on time, you're struggling to ship good software, you're releasing it, but then it's full of regression bugs, you're patching constantly, fix that first. If you can't ship well software well, um, you need to address that problem. Like, so that means you may need to slow down your practices today, you may need to start taking on less work, you know, but you do have to do things in order to just improve your ability to ship software well. And once you do that, you can start fine, but that's one thing. But shape up helps with that quite a bit. So yeah. And then just another different, um, this is called a, oh, I'm losing my terminology, this is like, I think it's jot notes, uh, not jot notes, it's people who do the, they do the diagramming when they take notes, don't take, I worked with a guy one time, he was a, he was actually a agile coach, he was from Ireland, and he took notes and he would draw as he took notes, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen, so he would sit down and think, he'd draw it off and he gets this picture of the notes, it's amazing. Yeah, it's called a picture diagram. But yeah. It was it was crazy how it was cool. So I like fun. So it's a but if we think about like the Agile Manifesto again, I want to first kind of come back to that. It's like you know if we look at what's out there, what's available. How many of the practices that we're doing pull these things into place, right? So and that's what you know. I think I think Shape Up right now is kind of leaning more this way than a lot of other things. And then as I've turned the corner and kind of said, you know. I don't know of all the things we spent years doing in Scrum provides us the significant value that we, we thought it did. Um, so I kind of look at this and, and, and see if you know, it makes sense. And what things do we check out from here that you know we want to still practice, right? So is Scrum really dead? Um, probably not. But I, you know, I think you can even apply things from other practices to it and try to improve it. Um, I would probably, if I worked with the company, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily try to kill it purposely, but I might have strong <laughs> recommendations on maybe adjusting practices to uh, free up people, right? And, and have people focus on what they really like to do and instead of burden bringing them through a lot of burdensome, burdensome practices and processes that, uh, you know, uh, and one thing, if, if um, if someone needs to be around, like if there needs to be a champion for a process, this is the sign, there needs to be a champion for a process, and when the person is not there anymore, the process starts dying off, it's probably a sign that the team doesn't resonate with that process very well. So we got a lot of options out there leading to their results. So what I say, take away, like, you know, have a close look at your practice, see what you can come up with, see what ideas are out there. 
you see what these any of these thoughts here today can overlap with what you think you're doing. Uh, there's no need to change it all at once, uh, but if you're not changing, are you really getting any better? So if you've been stagnant, not changing anything, and you're not delivering or you're having trouble figuring out what to build, when to build it, how to get your schedules aligned, um, you're, you know, if you're not changing, you're probably not getting better. How much overhead do you have in your practices right now? And another thing too is how aligned is your engineering team with the desired business outcomes? And I mean, don't really think about it. Like, is the business and your team actually in line with what we're doing? Like, do you understand? Like, can every developer, every engineer, every person in every role, QA, whatever role you're in, can they all say, "We know what business, what outcomes the business wants to achieve"? Do they know that? Can you answer that for your business? If you can't answer that for your business, then, you, know, you probably should be able to. Especially if you're working on something. Shameless plug. If you don't know how to start, <laughs> work with an external or an impartial coach. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, though, they do bring different perspective and value. They've seen all kinds of different stuff. They've been through the wars and the battles and the scrapes and the bangs and all this kind of thing. So they can come in and offer different perspectives, right? help you kind of start when you can't get started. If you don't know where you're going, don't know what to change, you should want to do something, they can really help you kind of get jump started. Um, like I said, I did a lot of the agile coaching, worked a lot with Scrum, but I probably wouldn't do that anymore. Some people that looked at me before, like six, seven years ago, would probably be wondering uh, what happened, but uh, I learned a lot to what happened. So, thanks to Han for the gift. Giffy. <laughs> thanks. For listening, thanks for coming out. It's a great crowd, it's awesome. Uh, far away questions or debates or whatever you want, and uh, if you got pitchforks, let me know. So, I'm yeah. you mentioned uh, Shaper quite a bit, um, and I've been at a place locally that's followed it. Um, you didn't touch on it in an absolute ton, but the role of uh, the Shaper. In the shape of role, um, in the twice you've implemented that, how important did you find that? Because I, I think that's interesting. The the role of like, yeah, you know, people that are more designated to shape up a document, and then like the vetting table and stuff. Because it was in the yeah. diagram, you didn't touch yeah. it. Yeah, absolute ton. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So just in case everybody didn't hear the question, so it was uh, who's asked? Who's your name? Jack. Jack. So Jack asked. I didn't talk a lot about the role of the shaper and shape up. And yeah, I covered off, I went pretty high level, right? Skirted through it, but uh, I don't have enough time. But the, the role of the shaper and shape up is critically important. And uh, like Mark and I can attest to that because we suffered through it without having it done well. And what happened was we couldn't, we couldn't deliver what we needed to deliver effectively because we had a lot of gaps. So what ended up happening was if we didn't have well shaped up stories, and even technical input into the shape-up stories before, right? Because you still need to have that technical liaison. You're not dedicated to shaping it, but you do need to consult it to make sure, yeah, that's viable, no, we can't do that, those kinds of things, right? If you don't have that and you start working on something, what ends up happening is the team that is assigned to the story ends up spending the first week or two of your six-week cycle doing all those activities. So you end up cutting your cycle down uh, by several weeks of time. And so you end up delivering smaller stuff. And that's what we found we suffered with. That's why I saw two cases about Mark. If you want to, you can answer that too. But. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of shape up is kind of that you, you empower the team, the development team, the designers to, to solve a problem, right? So, if, you know, and, and I think that's one of the beauties of shape up is often, from my experience, like some of your best problem solvers are your developers. And, and often in a world where, like in Kanban or Scrum, laying everything out of tickets and, and laying them wrong with it, They're, that kind of problem solving is taken away. But in order for those really smart people to problem solve, they need a well-defined goal, right? They need to know what the business needs and what they want. And if you've got a situation where that shaper, you don't have a shaper or that shaper isn't really filling that role properly, they come to you with a really nebulous concept of, oh, well, we think we need to use this tool, but we don't know why, or we think we, we don't like this feature, it needs to change, but we don't know how, and we don't know who it's for. Um, and then the dev team who's trying to problem solve is really just left stuck, and they don't know how to solve because they don't know what problem they're trying to solve. So I think the shaper is really less
less about being prescriptive on, on how to solve something. It's coming to you with the right problem. And a lot of the shaping at the beginning too has to kind of work with the development team and, and usually like some of the senior members to say, okay, this is the problem you want to solve. This is a rough idea of maybe the tools or the tech we could use. And they, they have that little bit of back and forth before things really get kicked off and then hands off to a team to, to go shape off and do. Um, but without that, yeah, it's like James said, you spend the first couple of weeks just trying to figure out what the problem actually is. Uh, and it's really, really hampers the process overall. Well. So really important. Anything else? I mean, uh, obviously we can mingle all the chapters. <laughs> Liam wants to say uh, say hi, I'm pretty sure. But uh, if anyone wants to fire any more questions or anything. Yep. Um, have you done any reading on the people who created Shape Up? Uh, yeah. yeah. So do you know about the diversity problems that they yeah. had and how the guy that created it doesn't think white supremacy is real? And do you yeah. think that would have an effect on how it's going to be perceived, probably? How it's implemented in the yeah that can like thrive in those environments. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that they have those attitudes. Like it's pretty, it's really disappointing, right, to see that. It is. And it's terrible in the industry, especially a profession that's, you know, let's say it's, it's male dominated and for men to come really? and say those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not encourage, not encourage diversity and, and, and you know, and, and women and, and more people to be involved because that makes a big difference. Or, you know, Which is why I'm speaking up for yeah. minorities right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> that difference of opinion is huge, right? And it's really needed, right? You need and so need one, of, one of the, like, um, discussions that happened in a lot of the news articles was, um, the voices of the people who wanted the product were heard, and if you were different in any way, you were not. So yeah. it's something to think about. Like, I yeah. don't think Shape Up, I, I do Shape Up. Yeah. There's a lot of great things about it, yeah. but I encourage anyone who is thinking about it to consider these, and if you do run into problems, consider that it might stem from. Yeah, it might stem from some of that. I mean, that's a really good point, yeah. I mean, it's, it's terrible. I encourage you all to read up about it. Yeah, if you don't know, read up about it, yeah. for sure, absolutely, because you should know, because it's, it's not, uh, it's not good. I hate Uncle Bob. The fact, like, all of his examples hate women. Like, <laughs> and I've sat there with a bunch of developer women in, like, a back row of a company, and we all looked at each other and was like, why is this happening? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's not cool. It needs to change. As it needs work, change a lot of work, and needs it needs support. Right, people need to speak up and say support us here. I support them. Need to encourage the voices. But, but that's right. Um, is Terry Lynn? Terry Lynn. Yeah. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, so, uh, but that's a good point about shape up. I don't know now. Um, I wish I could say we had very well diverse teams, but honestly, like I haven't had a lot. Uh, so. Well, no. Yeah. Um, and even at, at the. Our, at the U.S. I did more, and in Ontario we had a bit more diversity on the teams. Um, again, it's all about how you treat your team culture too, and how you empower people, and what autonomy you create overall. And if you don't focus on that in general, you can use whatever process you want, and the people who want to speak up are still not going to be speaking up because you haven't created the place or the psychological safety for it to happen. Right? So you got to understand that as a leader, and that's one of your biggest things as a leader. That's my role as a leader is to make sure the environment culture is created where that's encouraged and it's, it's and the, the enforcement is not, and the enforcement is to make it happen, is to ensure that you've got so a place to make it happen, right? So. And you have the right people in the right roles to make sure that it yeah, stays. Yeah, to make sure that it stays. So. Have, you, uh, have you worked with any organizations that put autonomy at the top of the value of thinking Thinking specifically of <laughs> holographic. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I have an organization that I've led, uh, for sure. Like Scrum doesn't do that. Scrum doesn't do that. Kanban doesn't do it, really. No, no. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, the way you do it is, I think, and the way I've tried to practice it is, you, you bring people in, you hire people, and they've got skills and expertise. And you need to trust them to do that job, and you can't micromanage everything they're going to do about it, and you can't stop their voices and encourage their ideas. So you need to create an environment where that's going to be happening, and you got to do it by example. Right? Yeah, I think the Hotel Five Town, like I've only been there nine months ago, um, but the, the hang up that I found there is it is hard to lead in that environment. Yeah. Except for the 
especially because a lot of the rules for shape up, um, a lot of the rules mention. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you all started looking at me, and I went blank. Uh, that's okay. I do that all the time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but it's it is tough. Yeah, Mark. Oh no! I was just gonna say the autonomy thing is something needs to start from the top. It needs to start from leaders, and they gotta encourage it, model it, and and show everybody do it. And again, it comes through with actions and how you talk to people, interact with people, all those different things. And it's not just one thing. I can tell you that for a fact. And uh, you gotta be conscious of all of them. If you're not, it will slip off. I don't know what else to say about it. I have a question. How does someone? Transition from being a technical leader to a leader. Uh, uh, do you want to talk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you transition by learning new skills. What skills specifically? Um, skills around empathy, trust, creating relationships, listening, communicating, um, understanding people. Like that's it's people skills. So you need to understand those things. How do you, you know, your outputs change, right? From being an individual who contributes, or even an individual who's leading technically, where you focus on a technical problem that has an answer, it's very logic based. You need to shift your mindset and your skill training needs to change to people and letting people flourish, understanding how to create other leaders, understanding that you want people to grow. You need to have a growth mindset for other people who you're leading because it's not about you anymore, it's about everybody else. And that's the shift you need to make. You need to adapt those skill sets and learn how to do those skill sets. And that's how you can master switching over to from a technical leader to a people leader, but still having your technical strengths. So they can still come to you for advice and everything, but that's not your focus anymore, per se. You can still be involved there, but just at a high level, that's what I was saying. What if that doesn't work? <laughs> what if that doesn't work? Yes. The people stuff? Yes. Maybe you're not cut out for leadership. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you can, you can always work on that stuff. No, I mean, what if you do those things and you have those qualities and you do not get promotions? Like, oh. I've never seen women in leadership. Oh, yeah, okay. That was a bad, sorry, a bad remark. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit for us. Um, no, um, yeah, see, that's a challenge because you, you, need, you need people in environments like that that understand I was that's say, what it like, takes. You might have skills, but if the people around you don't yeah. have the skills. They need, they need to recognize and see that. So sometimes, like, you know, if, if your values set in the way you want to lead and the way you treat people don't line up with your organization, then, you know, maybe, you, you know, there's opportunities to look at. So there's lots of different opportunities too, right? Or you need to coach up if you can, which, you know, again, is the person you're working with, do they have that mindset and can they see that and can you coach up towards them too and help them see what's needed and how they need to work too. It's a tough spot to be in. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. There's no easy answers to those, those things, right? Sometimes you're around good people too, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, so you're around good people, it doesn't happen, and there could be a million reasons why, or there could be a million reasons why you're human that doesn't happen too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm very interested in what Sahan would say about that, because he was a CTO at a very young age. Yeah. I know Mark had a question back there too. So, <laughs> um, so okay, say you're sitting here and you like what you heard about Shape Up, and you're like, oh my god, two week cool accounts, this is awesome, and autonomy to go solve my own problems. Um, I, I was fortunate that you implemented Shape Up where I now work, uh, so that was great, and I didn't have to go through this problem. But if you like it, you read the book and you want to implement it, how do you go about convincing? your CEO or your boss how like to take on the risk of having a two week period where nobody's working on anything that that is deemed important by the business, you know, like how do you how do you sell that? Um how did I sell it? I guess was my the question you're asking me. Um boy. I think first of all, I kinda as when you're responsible for like the team and everything that the team does the first thing I do is like I own that responsibility, right? And my neck is on the line for the whole thing, ultimately, right? So if if something doesn't go well, I'm responsible for that change, I'm responsible for the team, I'm responsible for coaching the team and the team's well being. 
So that's one way of doing it, I think, is you own and take responsibility for it. Again, it's like a bit of an autonomy thing, right? I was lucky in the cases that I've been in. Like at Reed Suite, we have Brett. Brett was very flexible and open to, you know, as a CEO, uh, working that way. He, he felt the same way. We were in alignment in terms of how we felt we were doing as a team, as an engineering team, and how we felt we needed to get better. And he trusted me to make the decisions to do that. So we that trust relationship, Terry, you talked about, right? Like if that's not two ways. I was going to say, like what I would do is tell the person that you think would bring it forward and then tell them to tell the other people. And then eventually you'll have a cohort yeah. of people who and, are pushing and, for it. Yeah, maybe in some yeah, ways it could be like a group yeah. all the time. Is that? Talk about it at lunch all the time. Talk about lunch all the time. <laughs> but create a movement. Creating a movement is good. They say to get a group of people, you know, get behind it. Um, really, though, like, you know, that's what your leaders in organization should be doing is, is doing the things that will help make everybody better and remove roadblocks. And, you know, removing barriers and creating better cultures and environments. So that's your job, plain and simple. So if you're bringing it to your leader and they're not doing it, then they, you know, they, they, sh they should be taking action to right, the change that. Get the Muppets going. <laughs> hey. But yeah, but that's that's your role, right? As you grow up, as you go on, so do your role. But that's, I would so definitely advocate for the power of getting angry when <laughs> something matters. I have had some very contentious relationships in my professional career, but as long as people are not taking it too personally, which they shouldn't be in a professional environment, if someone is simply being dogged about something that's wrong, be invested enough to say, you're wrong, here's why, and, you know, you need to step back and, uh, you know, respect the fact that the person and people you're talking to no better than you do. Yes. Great space, open minds, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I know it's not how to go back to, so we'll go back there. Thanks. I was just wondering, um, in terms of getting buy-in, uh, like, I mean, it's the whole shape up thing, it sounds kind of like a developer's kind of a dream, right? But, like, yeah. but I'm, I'm wondering, like, from the um, stakeholder perspective, like, uh, once you've transitioned, and you said, like, you know, you, you, sense, you have a sense to do own the success or failure of the, of the thing. How was that measured, and did you see anything interesting in terms of, like, what the actual outcomes were? Did, was there actually, from that, that perspective, yeah. visibility to, like, a uh, yeah. yeah. I think one of the big shifts was that overall, um, I think everybody in the company felt like we were now producing stuff that was, that mattered and was more valuable. Like we were producing stuff.
stuff that we knew was going to make a difference to our end users uh, because of the type of features we were able to build that we didn't build before. Like one of the things we did was we eliminated the backlog essentially and we only fixed really, really high priority bugs that were really pressing. Like we weren't fixing every little nitpicky bug because at the end of the day, like sometimes they don't get crossed over if they don't be used, but what really matters was we needed to create more capability and more value for the user at the end of the day, right? Like we're, we were working on a free suite, for example, of helping people with asthma and COPD and help attract their inhaler usage, right? So we really needed to build things that were going to help them have a better health outcome. That's your goal. And so if that was one of the big shifts we found. Um, we weren't big there, but in the large organizations too, we did little practices too, like we did weekly or even more frequently demo videos. We had a channel dedicated to demo videos being recorded out of the development team. So we could continuously show progress and get feedback as we were building, and we didn't need to do it in person, right? So we eliminate the whole in-person demoing thing, but we still wanted to demo and give feedback and show progress, right, to the company. And that was channel was opened up, but really to the key stakeholders that were involved in shape and making sure that things were gonna happen. And the other thing was, is the way that the shape of process where we put more work in up front, we felt more confident and, and better about what we were gonna take to build. And so then the measurement of progress was like basically like, uh, at the end of the six week cycle, if we look at all the stories that we had assigned and everybody was working on, what did we complete them? If we didn't complete them, did we renegotiate scope to agree on what we were going to deliver? Uh, where are we delivering them? And sort of that, that gave you a really clear lineage, like lineup would be like, you know, the business decided these six things were the most important things we wanted to work on. We delivered, you know, 100% of three of them and 80% of two of them. Right? So then you know where it was, and we renegotiated scope on two of them. So, it, it just felt a lot more collaborative, and uh, and the results were pretty easy to measure because of that link from the shaped up story to what you actually end up delivering. And then at the end of the six weeks, we did a whole, we would do a whole review. Uh, in the bigger organizations, it wasn't everybody in the company; it was a lot of stakeholder targeted ones. And we would do, uh, we would do things like technical enablement for certain product lines and things like that to the right stakeholders. Uh, in Breed Suite, smaller, we did smaller, we did it with the whole company, but we did a review and showed what was delivered for everything, right, put it all together. So it, it did line up really well as a stakeholder, because in my role too, right, I was a stakeholder, yet the responsible for the dev team, so I was still responsible as an executive for the business. Too, right? Well, that's just a question, but that's sort of how we lined it up, and it just worked well. Interesting question. Yeah. Like transitioning from a system where you're doing estimates to one that you're not, whether that's Hammond or Trade Hub or something else, like, if you're not estimating everything, and that's the metric of you know comparison of productivity and velocity, how do you say a, a system is better than another system? I, mean, I don't know. Maybe there's I, I've never really read up on it. Maybe there are ways to do that, or maybe you go back in history and you, you try and fake the estimates on what you deliver to see if it lines up with what your velocity was before. But from my experience with Shape Up, despite having a cool down, the the lack of like the overhead of the process of Scrum and even Kanban, anecdotally, it feels like we are more productive. People are getting ready to work on things um, without having to really be bogged down. And, um, like I said, it's hard to prove it, but to me, it, it feels like we are more productive. And, it, and there's a lot more ownership within a team, which I think just helps like culturally and with overall like inherent motivation for everyone in the team to, um, to strive to get those goals at the end. Instead of, you know, where if you're always at the end of a cycle and you're, you know, you always shape, you, you always scope out 30 to 40 points of work and you're always a little bit short, you know, that that desire to really pull it off starts to waver, or at least that was my experience. And I, we don't see that really in the shape of it's, It really is like that ownership drives that motivation. And I'm not saying people work overtime at the end, it's, it's really more about like, that, that, you know, it's like when you set your own goal and own plan for how to execute on something, you're more motivated to follow through on it than if the plan is kind of handed to you on a, on a stone tablet. Yeah. And people just seem to, to have that in mind when they're building it, and they build something that they know they can hit, and they're passionate about it, and they, they work hard and they get it done. And they get we, to use their creativity too. The they get to use their creativity too, like they're the person that's building out the product. Yeah. 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 
I think velocity is one thing too, but then like developer happiness is yeah. a completely yeah. other metric that I think yeah. is a lot of the times undervalued on business teams, yeah. especially. Because but that's when you're going to see churn. That's yeah. when you're going to see your best developers leaving you for another have company. The smartest people in the room, and they will not be productive, and you will yes. have the the complete opposite in the room. And if they're uh, happier, they can be more productive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So not even if else, if those developers. Yeah, well, I think the, uh, you're 100% right. It's the, the happiness is completely not right. The happiness and the comfort level that the teams experience in, in shift and stuff like this, because they're more power, they have more autonomy, they get to use more of their creative skills, just leads to higher productivity. Because in general, if you're working on stuff you like, what happens is you enjoy it. If you're being forced more and pulled more, you probably put up resistance, even if you still like it, because you are you're, feel like you're being taken away or you're not using your full self. Right? You want to show up as your full self. So I know Colab uses it, right? I haven't talked to anybody from Colab to get the experience that I want, well, I'd love to, to see how your experience is. I have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, and I've heard of other rumblings, and I know of other organizations that have adopted it. I can't remember. And I know, like, even like companies like GitLab, you know, probably heard of GitLab, they don't use ShapeUp, but they don't use Scrum or Kanban either. They use, but they do use a process that's somewhat similar, that they've got very remote oriented things. But uh, if you look around, you can see a lot of people drifting away from what we call maybe the traditional agile approaches and moving more towards these kind of things. And that's a lot of it is you can just create happier environments, less stressful environments, less overworked environments, and less burnout inducing environments for, for development engineering teams. Because that's a problem in the industry too, especially with the pandemic. People don't realize it, but I think they do more now actually. But during the first year, burnout rates were really high because people in the tech space were working. Right? And the systems and process we had in place did not help that at all. It just made it worse. Well, I'll wrap up. I know the guys are probably looking to clue up. I don't know what time we got in space, so I will pass it over to the guys. And yeah, thanks yeah. so much again, Jamie, for the great Thank talk. You. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. This is awesome. This is a huge turnout. Um, I think this is probably the biggest turnout we've had. Um, probably some pent up demand there. I don't know. But yeah, thanks so much for coming out, guys. It's really great to see everybody in person. And I uh, look forward to having more of these uh, soon. Uh, thanks again to TechNL and Get Coding for the space and the booze. Thanks for Liam for organizing everything. Uh, Liam's helping out, setting up the, the meetups and figuring out space and, and uh, talks and stuff like that. So yeah, if you or anybody else that you know would like to give a talk like this, um, reach out to me on Slack or reach out to Liam on Slack or Scott, and we'll, we'll try to set it up. Or if you have a venue, if you want to host it at your company's space, yeah. a group in like this and hang out, we'd, we'd love to bring in some more companies like Get Coding. Yeah, yeah definitely. And uh, if you're not on the Slack, just go to slack.endev.co and uh, you should be able to fill in a little thing and get an invite and uh, be able to join. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Does anybody have any, is there any like events going on in the, the community that people would like to, to pump happening? Yes, Mike, what's up? Uh, so, anyone interested in game development, if you haven't checked the Game Dev Slack channel, there's a CMF uh, webinar on using CMF for funding your independent games um, on August 3rd, I think. So that, uh, there is a link to that in the Game Dev channel on the Slack. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, check. The uh, uh, CTSNL, uh, we're doing our weekly meetups again. Not that jumping theme this uh, time, but it's at um, Element on uh, Topsail Road, Element Coffee and Bar from 7 to 10 on Thursdays. So that usually has a bit of a low showing, but uh, it's pretty pretty nice. That's on, that's on the go as well. Is there somewhere people can subscribe and get like event invites yeah. or notifications? The, the CTSNL um, Slack, which you can join by going to ctsnl.ca. Right. Yeah, so head up ctsnl.ca to join the Slack there. Cool. So that's it. Liam, did you have something you wanted to say? I mean, TechNL has a social tomorrow. You can go to that too, but it costs money, so yeah. <laughs> 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 this is my more fun. Uh, 
Thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for coming. I guess just quick housekeeping, please eat the pizza. If there's still drinks in the fridge, if you need the bathroom, come talk to me. And yeah, if you have an idea, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get to, I'll be uh,